and final topic of today. That is not only looking at a single sample when we focus on variances, but also being able to deal with more than one sample, and at least for today, with two samples at a time. So, we are in the two sample situation. Again, we assume we are. And here is what we can do. We would have two variances computed. How do we compare two variances? Well, I would say we do. Or there are two things you could do. You could subtract them from each other, or you could relate them to each other in a fraction like this, in a proportion like this. And of those two, we choose the latter one. We simply, if we have computed two variances and we want to compare them, we take one variance and divide it by the other and say, we have a variance which is this much larger than the other variance. I think that makes good sense. That's a measure of how much larger or how much smaller is one variance compared to the other. If we do this, we have to do the statistical thinking again. Now, when I take two variances and divide them by each other, I know this is not the golden truth. This is not, I mean, if I do that tomorrow or in the afternoon, I again compute two variances. So I repeat the situation, the whole thing, and I compute the relation between the two variances. This relation will be a different one in the afternoon than it was this morning. Alone due to the whole randomness, the sampling situation, the variability in the system, I know that computing such an, and we are going to call this an F, computing such an F, a relation, proportion between two variances, will change from time to time. And we have to ask the big question, to be intelligent here, how does such a relation between two variances change from time to time? And isn't that a big magic, that such an odd thing as computing first one variance based on 100 observations, another variance based on 77 observations, dividing those two by each other, number coming out, statistical or probability theory can actually help us. It can actually tell us how can such a thing this is kind of a derived feature of many different things into a single number, a single F. How can such a thing vary from sample to sample? Well, the theory can tell us. The theory can tell us that there is a distribution showing the behavior of such a thing. And, and as you have now learned, the way we name our st test statistics is named like the distributions here. So there is a distribution that is handling this, and this distribution is called the Snedekor F distribution, or in short, in our course, just the F distribution. So that's, a, that's the distribution. If you were probability or theoretic or mathematical, you would want to know, hey, you just claim this distribution. Can you prove it to me? Yes, I could, but I'm not spending the time. If you take two chi-square distributions that are independent, divide them by each other, and do the math, an F distribution comes out the other end. It's a well-defined distribution. It has a formula. It has, it's a right skewed distribution. So if you just looked at the distribution and I didn't uh, show you whether it was an F or a chi-square, I wouldn't know the difference just by looking at, at the shape. I mean, uh, the F and the chi-square distributions, just by looking at them, looks very much the same. So it's not easy to see the difference. It's an important point that an F distribution is not just an F distribution. There are many different F distributions. And now we have to record two sets of degrees of freedom because I could have 20 observations for the numerator variance and I could have 30 observations for the denominator variance. So I have two degrees of freedom. So there are as many F distributions as there are combinations of, uh, of, of integers, and that's many. Um, here is just uh, the same slide almost as we've seen for the chi-square. We can find values for the f. We, of course, we're going to do it just uh, in, in, in short. Uh, and we can find it in, in R as pf and qf. P for probability, left side probability, and, and QF for the inverse, for the quantile, for the percentile function. 
Um, that was, no, that's uh, we, just a little more theory, sorry. Uh, we still haven't uh, formulated the hypothesis. Now, we are going to test the hypothesis of two variances being the same. Remember, this was part of my motivation for doing what we do today, that was that such a decision could be interesting for the variances themselves, as they could be important for a production company, but it could also be important in choosing the right procedure for comparing the means, refer to my footnote of my table from, from the repetition previously. So there are many good reasons for being able to do this. The alternative can, as usual, be either two-sided, as stated here, or one-sided to the one side and one-sided to the other side. And here is the similar table, which does look a little bit different, but it's still the similar table as the, to the tables we have seen previously. Let's begin with the one-sided situation to the left, you could say, if the alternative is that we are going to prove that variance 1 is smaller than variance 2, that is, that would be the alternative hypothesis to prove variance 1 is smaller than variance 2, then what we do as the f is to take variance 2 divided by variance 1. And then we compare if the computed f, because the computed f will always be positive here. However, we say that if the computed f, again, this is the observed one here, and this is the critical value, if it is too large to the right, we reject. Now here is uh, actually, in, in trying to make the two-sided procedure simpler, uh, it, it might actually create some confusion if you have gotten very much hooked up and used to the other tables. Now there is a slight deviation on how the table pr proceeds now. If we go to situation two, that is, that the alternative now is that variance one is larger than variance two. I wonder if I said it correctly before, but at least I'm, I mean what we can see. Now I'm having variance 1 larger than variance 2 as the alternative. Now I, I don't, um, I mean, I, I, I make the one-sided thing in this way now, that I actually, I, I put it into the definition of the test statistic that I take now S1 and divide by S2. So I take the larger one and divide, or at least the supposedly larger one, and divide by the supposedly smaller one. In doing that, I have changed the whole thing around such that a, you, you should imagine that uh, it's like when we had, maybe, I should, maybe I'm spending too much time on this, maybe you wouldn't even have thought of it, but now, now I started, so I have to finish it. Um, if I compare with, uh, I'm trying to find the similar table from before, here it was. If I compare it with this table, when I have to claim something is too large to the right, I, s I see if it's too much to the right. And if I should claim something is too much to the left, I look whether it's too much to the left. I mean, in that way, this table makes good sense. Now, the way I look in the probability table, I'm running back to the table here. In both cases, in fact, in all three cases, I'm looking at an F to the right, actually. So, so that's where this table is. No matter whether it's one to one side or to the other side, I look whether the F becomes too much to the right. And this is because I make the change in the way I compute the F. So I, I'm, I make sure that the F becomes large to the right and not to the left by changing the way I compute it, right? So I take the larger one and divide, divide by the smaller one. So I put this one-sided thing into the construction of F rather in the looking in the probability distribution. It may create some confusion in, when you get used to looking at these things. It's just to make a point of this. If it's the two-sided situation, I do the same thing in a way, same meaning that I, in the construction of the F, 
I, that's why it says S capital M divided by S small m here. I take the largest one and divide by the small one. So the F also there becomes large. So the F always is larger than one, not smaller than one. And in doing that, I also go look for whether F, the computed F, is too large. Being a two-sided situation, however, now I should use, in fact, only half the probability po point, actually. So, so that's how it works. That's it for the theory. Let's do it in practice so we jump to the final.